time of taking a deep breath and pollen counting slowly in here. You breathe in the life breath of God, and after practicing this for six months, by now you are breathing out the love of God to share with one another. Isn't that beautiful? You are made with the breath of God. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. God's glory fills the earth. But sometimes, we, like Elisha, do not think we are ready to encounter glory. And yet, God's glory shows up in anyway. Sometimes we are like the disciples who witnessed Jesus' transfiguration and wanted to cling to that one glorious moment. And yet, God called them down from the mountain. So, we gather here today, some of us feeling ready and some of us feeling holy. <coughs> and that's okay. Yet all of us are called together in worship today and to be led by glory out into the world. God, may we receive your glory all around us, pointing us in the way that we should go, that you would have us go. So some announcements this morning. <coughs> Take a notice in your bulletin, you know, on top, our special um, friend Woody has gone on ahead of us in his memorial service this Tuesday. They are accepting hot lunch meals between 3.30 and 4.30. That's after the school lets out in the Family Life Center. His service is in the Family Life Center. So please bring your dishes before them and then stay. Ash Wednesday service is following our Wednesday evening meal. Yum, yum. And there is a praise and worship service next Sunday at 1 Is there anything else you wanted to say? Yes, you too can have one of these. If you submitted a love note, stay with us always, not only in our worship, but as we share the risk and challenge of living our faith. By your powerful spirit, turn our fear to courage. Your glory shines in the face of Christ. Shine in our hearts and lives. May your name be praised, glorious God. You know, there may be a lot of things wrong with this morning, but I tell you what, it isn't. It isn't the weather. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a blessing to go outside and remember to hunt for a fire. And to recognize that, we're going to sing a little bit. I know we all know it, but if you, if you don't, then it's on page 657. Brother Terry can just follow along with me or I can follow along with you. 
Okay, in the presence. And let us all stand still. Okay. Roar and all that fills it, 
We prepare our hearts for God's tithings and our offerings. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we remember Christ's transfiguration, we stand in awe of the glimpse of your glory revealed on the mountain. Just as Peter, James, and John witnessed the radiant presence of Christ, we too are transformed by your love and grace. As we offer our tithes and offerings, may these gifts reflect the warming light of your love in our lives. Just as Jesus was transfigured before them, may our hearts be transformed and our actions reflect the love and truth Jesus embodies. Bless our giving and use it to bring your divine light to a world in need. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Sometime after the service, the water has been consecrated, anointed, sanctified. You just come get your little bit, put a little cross on your forehead. Or if you want to dip your face in there and blow bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to stop you? We'll let you show us how. I'll show you how. <laughs> hands are freezing. Let's pray to God, shall we, and praise Him. What do you have on your hearts and minds? I've got some things for you. Matter of fact, we wrote them down. Y'all remember E.W. had a procedure this week. He's recovering at home. I haven't got an update on him yet, but I'm, I'm sure and hopeful things went well. Talked to uh, um, 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 uh, Joy. Joy. Oh, I had to talk to Linda. Oh. I'm sorry. No, I was trying to think of uh, Linda. Linda went to the hospital, scared us on, what was it, Thursday or Friday? Friday. Friday. But she's okay. She sounds good, speaking good. She's just ready to come home. As you can imagine, two days in the hospital do that to you. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't really find anything that was really wrong. Really? With her. Unless you got something, Irene? I, I went to the hospital and picked her up last night. Nice. And she's home resting. But nice. There doesn't seem to be any specific diagnosis. But she seems a lot better, I think. Personally, this is the witch doctor's nurse talking, that she does too much. It's exhaustion more than anything Okay. that she's suffering from. Okay. So she gets some rest now. Yeah. She has a doctor's appointment on Wednesday, but she's doing a lot better, and she looks a lot better. All right. Good. Praise God. She's got a little rest. Maybe she'll learn to... Incorporate that rhythm into her life. Anyone else? I got some stuff on paper. Yes, ma'am, Joyce. Um, I didn't have paper. That's right okay. On. My um, my son-in-law's daughter-in-law is seven and a half months pregnant, and the baby is showing heart stress, oh, and they may have to induce labor. So we pray for the little baby today, and mom. Elisa. 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 Sue asked if we remember the family of Sean Slocum. He was killed in a single car crash in Oakleaf yesterday. So remember that family. Is that a good traumatic situation? And for Gary Duggar, uh, he's having surgery for Whipple disease. And the surgery is going to take up to 12 hours. Don't get Whipple disease. Lord help him. Mike Gibson, he's hurt his knee really bad, so we need some help and healing and strength for Mike Gibson. <laughs> Uh, he can't even walk, it says here. He's going to the orthopedic Monday. Please pray. That was from Trish. What else do y'all have? The same thing that's going on with my oldest brother. He's almost 85. Then his wife, there. so she's bruised all over. So he's waiting to find out what x rays are. All right. Yes, sir, Bernie. It's, it's all Debbie this morning. She's yep. back. She did well. She's not playing football yet, but uh, <laughs> yeah, she's God. making it through. Thank you. Praise Thank God. you for all your prayers. Yeah. Good, good. Yes, ma'am. All right, coming back to you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I didn't know. We had several back there. Yeah. Uh, my sister-in-law is going to a chance today. Um, apparently, they do after hours or repeated. She has a lump behind her right knee that doesn't know what it is, but they're checking that out. And then Robert's brother is having knee replacement at Southeast Orthopedics in Fleming Island on uh, Friday. So if you'll just pray for Charlie and Kim, and hopefully that surgery goes well and Kim can put up with him during recovery. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's a lot. Yes, ma'am. Um, last week I had asked for us to pray for my Aunt Linda with her brain aneurysm, and she had her procedure, and she's doing amazing. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We want to uh, thank the Lord that Liz is back with us. After having a couple of steps in the end this past week. And it's good to see her. Yeah, she gave us another scare, too. 
Yeah. Quit doing that. <laughs>
the direction of the <laughs> Anyway, that's the way a church service was. There was no electricity, there was no music, <laughs> unless there was a, a banjo or maybe a guitar. And they, they worshiped God. Uh, I can remember when I was a child, I would come to church in here. Every, all the women wore black, and I was in, there was not a sound in the church except the pastor and the singing. There was no <coughs> fellowship, no talking. It was just, I was terrified, this little girl <laughs> in here. And then the other day I told Susan, our church is a choir. I'm not taking anything away from our beautiful choir. It just amazes me how they can make such beautiful sounds. But when we sing in this church, it's like all of you are members of a choir, which I guess you are. All God's creatures. What is it, Susan? Got a place in the choir. I got a place in the choir. And it's just so wonderful to feel that spirit. Not to say that the spittoon people. <laughs> I heard my mother just say, don't say that. <laughs> the spittoon people didn't worship God. They did in their style. And the very quiet, very extremely reverent people worship God in their style. But my goodness, I know God says, ooh, where does that sound coming from? Uh, Black Creek Methodist Church. My thoughts. Against us, and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's look at Mark. Mark chapter 9, verse 2 through 9. And this is the section on the transfiguration. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And they were transfigured. He was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one was with them anymore, but only Jesus. Verse 9, as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Praise be to God. So how many bumper sticker people do we have in here? <laughs> if I was to walk through the parking lot, is your car going to be covered in the back with bumper stickers? Or maybe your one favorite one? <laughs> uh, but I get a kick out of those who do that kind of stuff. <coughs> There's a few that over the years I thought were uh, pretty funny. What if Hokey Pokey is what it really is all about? <laughs> Driver carries no cash. He's married. <laughs> I'm retired. Go around me. Normal people scare me. Save our planet. It's the only one with chocolate. I get it. I get along fine with God. It's his fan clubs I can't stand. And of course, y'all seen and heard, heard this one. Do you follow Jesus this close? <laughs> For English teachers, I think it should be this closely or closely. Either way, y'all figured out now. But that last one is a good one. It's funny, but like all good humor, there's an element to truth about it, right? From time to time, we need to examine how closely we follow Jesus. We talk a big game about Jesus. We ask what would Jesus do? We wear the bracelets. We get the bumper stickers. We want to be like Christ. We claim to be followers of Christ. But how closely are we following Him? And what does it mean to follow Him? Mark has this account of this transfiguration. And I think it's a good example of how misguided we can be about following Jesus. He takes Peter, James, and John up on this mountain for a spiritual Retreat, and I highly recommend these for everybody. Jesus started to glow, and Elijah, Moses appeared to them. Peter thought it'd be a good idea if they just stay on that mountain. I can't blame him, can you? I wouldn't want to leave that experience. He even offered to help build a house for each of them, a dwelling place, so that they could stay with them on earth. I think that's kind of funny when you think about it. Peter must have thought it would be cool to be up there with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Why not stay there forever and not deal with the realities of life? What Peter did not realize was the moment on that mountain was not about escaping the world or going on a retreat. It was about God confirming once again that Jesus was his son. You remember those words that came? This is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. That's happened like twice in the scripture. Here's one of them. Another one being his baptism. They didn't understand that they were following a man who would die and then live again. And if they were serious about following him, uh-oh, they were going to have to 
die too. Following Jesus is the greatest thing in the world. But if y'all would admit, it can be hard at times. Following Jesus is more than just showing up to worship once a week, church, Amen. for an hour. Following Jesus is more than just throwing a little money in the plate once in a while. Following Jesus is more than just reading your Bible occasionally. Following Jesus is more than letting someone in front of you in traffic bless people with your cars, but that's not what it's all about. Most people don't realize that when Christ calls people, He calls them to come and die. What many don't understand is that to experience the abundant life in Christ, we have to take up a cross and die. Die to what? We'll get to that. Hang on. Jesus was clear about this from the very beginning. Huge crowds are following Jesus wherever He goes. And there was a certain energy about Him. More than likely, this guy had charisma. He had a way with words and he could perform miracles. He challenged people in authority, didn't he? I mean, he loved everyone, especially the down and out, left out, thrown out, all those who wouldn't love a guy like that. One day, Jesus looked over this huge crowd of followers and he wondered if they really knew what it meant to follow him. Then, with no regard for what is taught in the Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people, <laughs> Jesus spoke some of the most harshest words we find anywhere in the Gospels. He said, do you really want to follow me? Consider what it's going to cost you. You must give up everything that is dearest to you, take up a cross and follow me. Unless you do that, you cannot be my disciples. Jesus' words, not mine. And that's what the crowd wanted to hear or didn't want to hear. I don't think they wanted to hear that. They thought this magnetic man was on his way to his own empire. They hoped that if they followed him, they would share in all this power and glory. But what they didn't realize was that when Jesus said these words, he was on his way to Jerusalem, to the cross. And to follow him meant that you were willing to take up one of those crosses also. The Bible does not mention it one way or the other, but I imagine that after Jesus spoke these words, most people in the crowd fell back from Jesus, disappointed and dejected. I suspect I and some of us here this morning are like the crowd. Most often we follow Jesus, but at a safe distance. I don't want to get into all that dust he's kicking up. We seek Jesus for the perks and the benefits. Turn your TV on the TVN or one of those uh, Christian networks and watch the preachers and see what they talk about. How good your life can be. Always, always, always how you can improve and be better and have more. And I don't think that's what Jesus' message was at all. We want our eternal salvation, yes. We want it to be secure, yes. But to be sure, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but they're not always prepared to follow Jesus closely because we know that there's a cost. The truth is that important, sacred, and virtuous things in life have a cost, don't they? The glowing bride, an exciting groom, Stand before me at the altar. The bride is thinking, Oh, this is the man of my dreams. He's going to bring me flowers every day. He's going to know what I am thinking and know exactly what to say. He's going to hang on my every word and always be patient with me. He will always just want to cuddle. He's going to rub my feet whenever I ask and surprise me with breakfast in bed. It's better, ladies. <laughs> but the groom is thinking, oh, this is the woman of my dreams. She's always going to look this young and beautiful. She will always meet my needs. She will always greet me when I get home with a wink in my
my favorite meal next to my lazy boy <laughs> at ESPN on the television. She will always tell me how strong, brilliant, and gifted I am. And she will never nag me. <laughs> now, as the bride and the groom are having these thoughts, they're paying no attention to me when I say marriage is not to be entered unadvisedly, but reverently, discreetly, and in the fear of God. The bride and groom are not really paying attention when I ask them to repeat these words for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. Then sooner or later one of them disappoints the other by not living up to expectations. And real marriage begins. <laughs> Amen church. Amen. <laughs> one of them gets sick. Or one of them becomes difficult to live with. And real love and commitment <clears throat> begins. <clears throat> Acceptance, forgiveness, and mutual understanding must be born among them. Perhaps the couple dreams about having children. They think about little people that look just like them. They think of giggles and bubblegum breath. They think of Christmas ball games and ballet classes. They think of their need of being needed. Then children come, and they are definitely needed. <laughs> and the real sacrifice of parenthood is required. They get up in the middle of the night crying baby. They lose sleep. Their children develop minds of their own. They talk back and they rebel. Their children stay all night worrying mom and dad sick. The shallow illusions die and real love is born. You see, all the important things in life cost us. We should be surprised to find out when the most important person who ever lived spoke about the most important thing we can ever do, he said, that sacrifice is required. A cross is required. A death is required. Why, Jesus? He puts it so poignantly. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What did Jesus mean by that? What did Jesus mean by all this death business? He said, if a grain of wheat does not fall on the ground and die, it will not bear fruit. He says, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You see, real life begins when we die to ourselves. When we die to control. When we die to our selfish desire and trivial plans. Real life in Christ begins when we surrender our ego, our pride, our stubbornness. And God can get started with us when we come to a place where we are free from the bondage of trite preoccupations <coughs> and recognize that our only need is God. And that's what it means to die, not physical death. Y'all get it now? It takes this stuff. There are many who never accept this. This is why people have been Christian all their lives who are never spiritually fulfilled. This is why there are Christians who never grow in their faith. They've never really made a decision to be a disciple. We want just enough, don't we, to get that ticket in. So in other words, y'all just want some fire insurance. Unless you become a disciple, you'll never experience the abundant life. Somebody in the church understands that. Until you carry your cross and die, you can never really live. We want God to use us, but we got to make ourselves available. Empty ourselves of the things that have become more important than God. And allow God to do what? Cleanse us. Renew us. We must come to the place where we pray, God, I'm tired of doing things on my own. I'm tired of thinking I always know what's best. I'm tired of doing the same things and expecting to get different results. I want you to take over my life. I hand it all over to you. 
I let go of the things that I have made more important than you, and I ask for you to fill me up. Use me. And if that's your honest prayer, guess what? God will move like a tidal wave in your life. Lastly, a pastor was on a hospital call while in seminary. He reminded me his story of this spiritual death that is required of all disciples. He just started seminary and was visiting patients with a supervisor who was a little rather unorthodox. He had a way of getting to the truth of things without being abrasive, which is good if you're going to make your living as a chaplain. They were visiting a patient who was recovering from a drug overdose. The patient was a prominent man in the community. He said to the supervisor, I have lost everything. My job, my reputation, my livelihood, I have lost it all. This is the end for me. The supervisor responded, oh, that's interesting because I see this as just the beginning. The patient responded, what do you mean the beginning? The supervisor said, well, you said you've lost everything. Everything? The patient said, yes, everything that really mattered to me. The supervisor replied, well, that means God has you all to himself. Oh. Just think what we can do with you now. <coughs> So the point is, come and die, church. Your real life is waiting. Amen.